This Photography News podcast is sponsored by MPB. There's never been a better time to make good use of your kit. Inspire others, make some extra cash and make a difference. Sell your used kit today at mpb.com forward slash sell and let someone else love it as much as you have. In this episode of the Photography News Podcast, we react to the amazing Nikon Z9 and answer all your questions on shooting autumn landscapes. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Photography News Podcast. My name is Roger Payne. I'm the Editorial Director at Photography News. And in light of recent managerial events in North London, I thought I'd introduce my two colleagues based on which would be more likely to lose a managerial job after four months. So, starting with contributing editor, Mr. Kingsley Singleton. Hi, Kingsley. Hi, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm all right. I'm so, I, I'll respond to that by saying that I've always seen myself more as the kind of mercurial flying winger than the, I mean, managers, who needs them? You need superstar players. <laughs> well, exactly. And this is why, you know, I thought you'd be far more suited to being a, yeah. A, a, a stylish player rather than a rather than a man. I mean, I've seen you play football, and I wouldn't actually describe it as being stylish. <laughs> Enthusiasm is my major characteristic. It is very enthusiastic. And welcome also to probably feeling slightly uh, slightly aggrieved about the recent events in North London. Editor of Photography News, Mr. Will Chung. Hi, Will. Hi, Rog. Hi, Kingsley. A quick explanation <laughs> is that Tottenham Hotspur, which is uh, Will's team have recently removed their manager after a relatively short period of time, four months. Um, and Arsenal, Kingsley's team, <laughs> are probably gloating and laughing quite a lot. Go on, Kingsley. i just like to say I thought he was doing a grand job. <laughs> anyway, enough of the football chat. This is a, photo- a, ph- a photography podcast after all. It's easy for and you to say. <laughs> <laughs> it is a photography podcast of a difference this time round. We're changing the format up a little bit. And in a short while, we're going to delve into a series of reader questions or listener questions specifically about autumn photography. Um, Obviously, it's that kind of time of year. It's a very photogenic time of year and lots of people are out with their cameras. And on the basis of all the questions that we've got to get through, we're going to cover off quite a lot of detail about that. And also, ordinarily, what we do is we talk about what we've been photographing. But actually, we thought we'd bypass all that this time around because since we've last sat and chatted, Uh, There's been a pretty significant camera launch in the form of the Nikon Z9, which has been much rumoured and much anticipated. And now it has finally arrived Um, last week. I think we got the the relevant information through from Nikon in the UK. And Kingsley, I'm going to come to you because this is something that has been on your radar for quite some time. I think you've been quite excited about what the spec was going to be. So um, why don't you um, top line us what, what it's all about, apart from being rather expensive? Well, of course, um, yeah, when Nikon were designing it, they came to me and uh, sought my <laughs> <laughs> opinion. Um, well, I, I mean, they ignored guessing... it completely, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't hover, which is weird. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess people have probably already seen the spec. I mean, it, it, I, I think it delivers on one of the biggest things that I have been hoping that they would do, which is, as everyone suspected for a long time, incorporates this stacked sensor design, which kind of just pushes it a kind of a bit down the road towards being, you know, like a, a complete replacement for the DSLR. You know, it sort of knocks off that 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 those kind of last few remaining reservations, I suppose you could say that people might have. Um, and along with that, um, as I'm sure Will 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 talk about as well, but it, it, it's revolutionary because they've completely dispensed with a mechanical shutter. It's only got an electronic shutter. So, um, and this is, this is, I mean, it's not the, obviously it's not the, the only um, camera to do that, but it's the first full frame pro camera to have ever done that. And obviously Nikon believe that the scanning speed of this sensor is sufficient that, you know, it's not going to cause any problems, which, you know, you associate with electronic shutters, like the kind of the rolling, movement that you get on um on sort of you know while, while panning or shooting high speed subjects so that's the so that so the the megapixel count is how much from the stack sensor it's 45.7 isn't it yeah 45.7 which is I, th- I mean i think it's the same as the z 
seven two you know no one is looking at this as a high res camera even though it basically is it's you know it's 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 as, it's as high as nikon themselves go and perhaps what that does is it leaves open a z8 which could be like a 60 megapixel you know whether they do the kind of the stack sensor in that yeah i don't know but perhaps they'll increase it in that but i mean th- th- that is interesting because really it's the speed of the camera uh, that's been quoted that, that that is kind of making all the headlines rather than that resolution and what are the speeds well it's got this um it's it's 20 frames per second in raw with sort of full af um and the, the af you know promises to be amazing as well you know it's it's this kind of um there are loads of things that the Z9, sorry, the Z7 II and the Z6 II do really well, but they're not they're not amazing at action subjects. Like they're great for you know if you if you want to use a really fast lens and do a portrait, you switch on the eye detection AF, it will find the eye, follow the eye, keep everything pin sharp all the time. But with action subjects, it's not it's not quite so hot. So this is this is going to sort of massively elevate that. And what it also does is it brings back Nikon's 3D tracking AF mode, which hasn't been on a mirrorless camera yet for Nikon. So on the D850 and the the D6, they had this 3D tracking, which is pretty amazing for following the subject around the frame. So, I mean, obviously, you know, very, very keen to get my hands on it. Are you going to buy one? Based on what I get paid for coming on here, it'll take me about 37 years, <laughs> uh, by which point there's probably going to be like a, a Z9 Mark 17. So what, you get paid for coming on here. <laughs> Will, well, we need to renegotiate. Yeah. I must talk to you about those invoices. Um, it's, I, I would love one, um, but it's it's over. I mean, actually, this is going to sound mad to 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 a lot of people, but like it's it's quite keenly priced. It's five thousand two hundred ninety nine pounds body only, but that is significantly cheaper than Canon's R three and Sony's A one, both of which it sort of competes with or surpasses in in sort of some way. So. You know, you can look at it as aggressive, even if it's a whacking great load of money. <laughs> Keenly priced at five thousand two hundred and ninety nine pounds, Will. So presumably you'll be ahead of the queue yourself to get to get hold of one. Well, Kingsley, Kingsley makes a good point about the price and it is very aggressive. And he's, he's also talked about the um, the lack of mechanical shutter, which I found most intriguing. So I did spend a time, a bit of time on YouTube watching how people have been working with it because some people got early samples and some ambassadors have been playing with it. And one guy I saw has had it for three months, I think he had it for. Um, but it was, it, was, it was fascinating to see that there was no problem with rolling shutter and no problems that I could see anyway with um, flickering light sources, which can be another problem with um, every electronic shutter. So I was fascinated by that. Will I be at the top of the list to, to buy one? To be honest, I don't like deep bodied cameras. That's a personal thing. I'd much rather have you know, a camera which I can add a battery pack to if I want to, mm. but I don't particularly like it built in. So obviously I'm not against I'm not I'm not pro shooting the, what these guys shoot, but BOS R three, for instance, now now the Nikon Z7 and uh, Z9, both deep body cameras, it put to me less in than in a way than the, the Sony A1, which does amazing things without the deep body. So presumably that the, the deep body is to house additional batteries to power it for longer periods of time. And the vertical handling aspect where all the controls are mirrored. In right. the same way, when you do buy that on grip, like you can for the Z7 II, you know, you get the controls mirrored. So when you're shooting portrait mode, everything is, you know, instinctively um, positioned for pros with muscle memory in, in, in that respect. But I mean, it's a personal thing. But um, I mean, I must say the spec is amazing. As I say, watching some of the YouTube videos, what people are doing with it, the, the follow focus, the eye detect, that looked incredible because it was picking up subjects are quite small in the finder and it was very sticky it's very tenacious i noticed on again this is on demo videos rather than me having tried it myself but i was in, i was impressed to see how good it was because the z72 is okay but ain't great mm. um, not compared with the canon EOS r5 for instance um so to see the, the z9 appear and to kind of take another a significant leap forward i thought was um was impressive so i'm so, looking forward to seeing it go on kingsley I was going to go back to the uh, what Will was saying about the kind of the handling and stuff. And one of the other notable features is that there's a new designed, uh, newly designed sort of LCD screen on it, which tilts in four directions. And what that means is that you it not only tilts out when you're holding it horizontally, but if you hold the camera vertically, it will also tilt out so you can see it at low angles. And that is something that 
um, I kind of noticed on the Z7 II, which is that it's wonderful in, in that you can, the, one of the great things about things like animal IAF and person IAF is that you can sort of keep the camera away from your eye and you can expect it pretty much always to pick up the eye. So you can hold it in different, you know, different, you hold it low, hold it high, concentrate on the composition and stuff like that. But one of the times it isn't so successful at that is when you when you're framing vertically, which is what I do for a lot of dog pictures. And so recently I was holding it, you know, I was holding it right down near the water and framing one of my dogs in the water. And the thing is, like a lot of that was guesswork because you can't really see when it's vertical. But now you will be able to see a lot easier and you'll be able to see where the focus point is and all that other stuff. And something I didn't mention about the speed is that it's also got this continuous plus mode, uh, which shoots at 100, 120 frames per second, uh, albeit in JPEG. JPEG. Right. Yeah. And at 11 megapixels. So it so it kind of quarters the resolution. But, you know, I mean, 11 megapixels, I think it kind of depends what you're you know what you're trying to get doesn't it um i mean for so most is that people, at full it's... frame or is that cropped so no it's it... full it's it's the full view um but so it's... it's bidding pixels off then i presume yes yeah right yeah i mean it's it's amazing stuff I, I don't i can't imagine i would need more than 20 frames a second but you know i suppose if if the option is there and of course it does amazing things in video as well but you know who cares about that <laughs> I was gonna make, it's the one thing that <laughs> neither of you have mentioned is about the video but um is, is there anything is it is it 8k i presume it is 8k is it or uh, or is it a is it 4k at ridiculously high frame no, rates you can get 8, 8k at 60p so there's an awful lot of information going into the into the cards i mean um i, I assume because nobody's mentioned heat problems i assume they've got that sorted having a bigger camera deeper body obviously helps so that the heat seems so much more efficient mm. but it must be generate hell of a lot of heat um, but it'd be good to see. It'd be amazing to see what the quality of the 8K video at 60p is. I mean, Kingsley talked about the fast shooting, but obviously you've got, you've got that as well. So just shoot video. If you want the still from it, just grab away. The quality would be amazing. Kingsley? One, one of the other things that um, me, me and Will have been pigging messages backwards and forwards about this. I have to say, Will seems less uh, a whole lot um, less whelmed than I am. About it. I wouldn't <laughs> say he's underwhelmed, but I'm, I'm definitely uh, sort of extra whelmed whatever comes beyond overwhelmed but um one of the another thing that is good is that they've reinstated light up buttons which is really useful when you're shooting in low light so like the d850 has a thing where you, where you flick the on off uh sort of switch it sort of passed on and it, mm. and it lights up all the buttons illuminate in this kind of like sort of you know they don't they're not bright but it means it's a bit easier to see what you're doing. Although Will will now say, well, you should know what you're doing anyway. You should know where the buttons are. He's got his hand up, so he wants to say something. <laughs> what it also does, which is really cool, I noticed in a, in, a, in a screenshot, is that it has a like a red. So when you do astrophotography, you often use a red light to stop your eyes. When your eyes have become accustomed to the dark, you don't, you don't want to use a bright torch because it, it's kind of going to be blinding. But the menus can be displayed in this low red now, which I think is brilliant. It's a really nice touch. Will, what? And I, what? <laughs> I'm pleased Kingsley got to the red LED and the red reload thing because he did send me a YouTube of that. I did send a, an underwhelming response to his YouTube <laughs> link. But no, to be fair, I'm not underwhelmed by it. I mean, I'm mean, very impressed by the thing. And I'm pleased, Nikon, I've got something which competes with, you know, the Canon EOS R3 and the, the Sony A1. Um, but I mean, we were talking briefly about the Z8 or the next model that comes out. That would be for me. I mean, I think you will know people listening to this pod podcast. I'm a big resolution fan. So if this edit comes out with 60, 70 megapixels and has some features that have cascaded down from the Z9, yeah, I'll be there with bells on, to be fair. So just to wrap this up, Will, I'm going to put you on the spot. Um, Kingsley, I think I already know his answer to this. <laughs> but if you were going to choose, if you had to choose between Z9, R3 and A1, money, no object, which I know it never is to you anyway, um which one would you be choosing <laughs> oh that's a difficult question because i haven't handled properly two of those cameras but i've seen and read so many things about the sony a1 that that might be that might take priority of those three interesting maybe interesting do you know what like the interesting part of that is though that that is the one that is the one manufacturer as far as i understand that's the one manufacturer of cameras that, that will doesn't have so this is really just about kind of like spreading, increasing the number of logos in his cupboard. 
<laughs> hey, it's people like me keep the trade going, can I just that, say? That <laughs> people are suffering from gas, you know. Yeah. You know people should syndrome. like dealers should be out clapping on a Thursday night for Will <laughs> Jones. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, some good stuff. I don't know when we're going to get the camera in, Will. I don't know if you've been given any indication as to when the camera is going to be coming in for you to test it, but I'm sure you will give it a thorough testing and I'm sure we'll cover it again on the podcast at some point in the near future. Uh, but talking of the issue, uh, it's probably a perfectly apt time, time, moment, if you like, to just recap on what's in the uh, the latest issue, Will. And of course, the Gear of the Year Awards is in full flow, I believe. Well, the gear of the year, we launched um, an issue or two ago, and it runs until uh, early January when the voting closes. But yeah, we've worked hard at picking um, a load of products in uh, many categories. Short is, I mean, some, there's some great stuff there. Um, I don't think the Z9 is in there, of course, because that um, came out after the, uh, the nominations. But the voting is open for the gear of the year awards now. Um, some great categories. I mean, you know, one thing that pleases me about the awards is that we don't just cover the glamour stuff, you know, the cameras and the, the fast aperture lenses, but we do do inject paper and colour management devices. And, you know, they're not, you know, they're not greatly exciting products, but they can all help a photographer achieve the right result. Um, and, you know, like colour management, I, I, I calibrate my monitor every month to try and make sure I get, get them the right colours. And so I'm pleased that we recognise, you know, those um, those categories in our awards. And what about the issue that you're currently working on? What um, what can the uh, the listeners and readers look forward to when that comes out? Well, this issue we're working on now doesn't come out until towards the end of November, and it's our Christmas special. So we, we have got um, a huge Santa's buyer's guide, so you know photographers are looking to treat themselves. Or, of course, if you've got a partner who knows you're a keen photographer and doesn't know what to buy you, it's the sort of thing you can just leave lying around casually in your sitting room for them to view um, and maybe show a few things crossed out, you know, or ticked. You know, for instance, we might be mentioning the Z9 is being on Santa's list for somebody. So I'm sure Kingsley will leave <laughs> the screen in his living room for his wife to see. But yeah, I mean, um, that's a big thing. We've also got the the new Fujifilm camera, the medium format camera that came out a couple of months ago, the GFX 50S Mark II, um, and that's a camera that um, brings medium format within, <laughs> compared with what we we're just talking about, the Z9. It brings medium format digital photography within easy reach. You can buy one with a 35 to 70 millimeter standard zoom for £3,800, which is an absolute bargain compared with the uh, before-mentioned Nikon Z9 and the Canon SR3, et etc. Et hmm. So that's my big test, and um, I've got it somewhere in, the, in my living room. It's, um, I mean, it's style just like the GFX 100S, the 100 megapixel camera, and it's, um, it's lovely, and it's um, a review I'm really looking forward to getting stuck into when I take it out. Excellent. So the issue is out towards the end of November. Yes. Um, you can find that. Uh, if you can't find it in stores, then you can read it online. Uh, the uh, URL for our website is www.photographynews.co.uk. And just as a reminder, you can also get in touch with us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And the handle for those three is at Photo News PM. This Photography News podcast is sponsored by MPB. Use their free online valuation tool to instantly find out exactly how much your gear is worth. Get super fast payments straight into your bank account, and if you change your mind at any point up until you get paid, they'll ship it back for free. So, as I said at the start, we're going to go a little bit off-piste, as if we haven't already gone a little bit off-piste, we're going further off piste with our next section where we've we threw our doors open to reader questions around uh, the, th the theme of autumn and autumn landscapes. And we got a number come in. Um, and so we're going to cover off some of those. We've got a few here. I don't know if we're going to get through all of them, but thanks to everybody who got in touch. And the best way to get in touch with us is using our email address, which is podcast at photographynews.co.uk. But if you're looking to get out over the next month or so to make the most of the autumnal colours, hopefully we'll be able to um, give you a little bit of information as to how to get them better. And Kingsley, I notice, for the people who can't see this, which is everybody who's listening, is wearing a lovely autumnally coloured, um, what is that, a gilet? 
Is that a? But I would have called it a body warmer. It's a it's a body warmer in my house. Right. Okay. Well, it's a <laughs> lovely orange. It's it's almost it's, um, borderline high vis. I quite like it. I was motivated by how similar it looks, although it is not quite as red as Marty McFly's body warmer in Back to the Future. Indeed. Uh, and which also, was... you were motivated to put it on because presumably your heating's not on. No, it's November the first. We're not. I mean, <laughs> Christ, well, what are we made of? We're not made of that, are we? <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I'll come to you on the first one then, Kingsley. Um, <laughs> and uh, the first one comes from Alex F., who's in Cambridge, not far from us. Wonderful. Um, how can I get better pictures of the golden hour and autumn colour at this time of year? Is it a case of using filters or is there a way of capturing the intensity of colour just by using the right camera settings? Kingsley, mm. it's quite a lot to get through there. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, I, I guess we'll, I mean, you know, ho- hopefully we'll we'll sort of nail some parts of it. Um, I mean, it's a it's a mix, isn't it? It's it's a mix of settings and a mix of accessories, um, and it's a mix, and it's a. It, I, I'd also include approach in that, um, because, you know, the way that we look at color is dominated by color contrast as well as, you know, sort of the the brightness of the light or you know what camera settings we're using and stuff like that. So, to take to, to 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 take the idea of of kind of leaf color to start with mm. um one of the things that you can do is 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 try to frame uh leaves against contrasting colors so whether that's like a blue sky or a or a dark gray sky everything is going to sort of seem to be enlivened in that way and you can i mean sort of in terms of exposure you can like i, I shooting stuff like this i'd always suggest shooting in raw because it gives you the capacity to control things after the event and that might mean changing the exposure a little bit changing the contrast a little bit increasing the saturation a little bit um but in terms of kind of shooting like when shooting quite often no matter whether it's sort of autumn color or or kind of golden hour color sometimes the camera is sort of motivated to overexpose slightly and by underexposing a little bit you can you can make color like even by half a stop third of a stop two thirds of a stop you can make colors a little bit more intense and, and sort of, you know, along with that, you can think about bracketing because you might find there are some areas of the of the scene that are, you know, that want to remain light. And obviously a lot of camera manufacturers also have sort of built in simulations and, and colour sort of palettes, don't they, in their cameras where, you know, Fujifilm is obviously the one that springs to mind with their film simulation modes with things like Velvia, uh, if you want to go for something that's quite punchy. But I think um, I'd, I'd be right in saying that most camera manufacturers have a variety of that, whereby you can dig into your menus and start, you know, punching up colours and stuff like that. The things like that are, if, if you're shooting RAW and JPEG, then you're going to get the best of both worlds in that way, because you can sort of, you know, you, you can play with those settings and see what you can get straight out of the camera. But then you've also got a RAW file, which arguably will, will look pretty flat compared to a, a, a sort of an in-camera processed JPEG, which might not seem as lively at all. But it does give you that sort of latitude after the event. And Will, what about what about you know when it comes to making the most of colours in autumn? What about filters? Any particular filters that Alex should be considering in this mix? Yeah, without doubt, the filter they have is a polarizer because you know the light reflects off leaves, um, and it, it, the, the light when the light hits a leaf, it scatters. It, it becomes polarized. So the whole point of a polarizing filter it cuts down all these scattered wavelengths. So when you put the polarizer on, polarizer on and you rotate it, you see actually the glare from the leaf is, is gone. So obviously this depends on the angle of the light and how it's striking. But um, if the sun's shining, I'll definitely get um, a polarizer on there, on there. And Kingsley mentioned the underexposure aspect of it. And, you know, I think something I would do as well, definitely. And if you have got some saturated modes at your disposal, then, yeah, gave a bit of saturation, a bit of underexposure. In processing, you know, some of the... Some of the softwares now, some of these um, simulations are appearing in in those softwares, so you can just dial them in. So I'm intrigued about the underexposure element of this because I, I suppose I'm thinking, you know, Kingsley mentioned a third of a stop or two thirds of a stop. Surely you can just do that anyway when you put the when you drop the picture into Photoshop afterwards, don't you? <laughs> I mean, do you really need to be what? Explain to me and Alex why I need to be underexposing by a third or two thirds of a stop in camera. If you're seeing it, I think, Roger, at the time, you know, you, you're taking it and you think, I, I want to try and get it right in camera. Um, and Alex hasn't mentioned whether, is an Alex female or Alex male? Um, no. Okay, it doesn't mention whether they're shooting, you know, JPEGs and using them out of the camera or, or RAWs. And you, you're right, of course, you can do anything you like during um, during processing. 
it's interesting to note also, of course, there was a movement a while ago that um, people photographed with their histograms to the right. I think it's particularly in America because they want to use more of their more of the levels in the highlights. And both of us here are advocating um, underexposure as opposed to overexposure because shooting histogram to the right was actually favoring overexposure. But we're going the other way because if you can actually, and it does work. I see. So you're a, you're more of a histogram on the left man as well then, Kingsley. <laughs> well, I mean, I think that's an interesting point. I suppose like I've not actually thought about that that particular piece of advice in a while. And maybe the reason for that is because the point of shooting with the histogram to the left was that you wouldn't lose detail in the highlights where it's more difficult to return and that you would it's easier to boost shadow detail. And maybe modern cameras are just better. You know, you, you can boost shadow detail better without getting sort of nasty kind of noise and stuff in it so maybe, maybe that's why it's you know as as a tip you don't sort of see it I mean I think in like in, in low light photography you know cityscapes things like that I think I think people still I, th I think I would probably still do that I'd still sort of expose to the you, you meant to expose up to the point at which things start clipping aren't you I believe that's the case. Yeah, don't expose things oh, yeah. because it'll yeah. <laughs> just empty. you'll have no detail on anything. That's high key. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the uh, increase in ability in shadow details of cameras now is a relevant one here because there are far more levels in the highlights than there are the shadows, which mm. is why when you really rank, you know, worked hard on the shadows, there used to be all this noise. Mm. But now, I mean, I test cameras, I overexpose and underexpose into a bracket and pull them all, you know, pull raws here, there, and everywhere. And I think if you underexpose by two stops now, you can recover it really well in raw with actually very little problems, mm. unless you're getting really, really, you know, into the realms of pixel peeping, uh, which of course we're not. Okay, good. Well, there you go, Alex. That's a, that's a good start. Hopefully that's given you an answer there. Um, Will, I'm going to come straight back to you for this next one, which comes from Pat Baker uh, in Coventry. And he or she, again, maybe we should get, maybe we, if you've got a, <laughs> if you've got a name that is, uh, that can be applied either way, you should let us know because we don't want to, we don't want to get that wrong. But Pat Baker in Coventry says, at this time of year, I see lots of beautiful leaf colours, but often they're not in the most scenic of places. Do the team have any location tips for the best autumn colour and scenery combined? And where are they heading this autumn? Well, I'm assuming that Pat isn't going to try and stalk one of us. Um, but Will, <laughs> where, where do you head when it comes to locations for um, uh, for, for autumn colour? Because Pat's right, you know, you can see some really nice um, colours down the road, but it's not necessarily particularly photogenic. I mean, it depends what sort of colour Pat wants as well. I mean, if um, if Pat wants bright reds and so on, you want aces, then the best place to go to are, are Arboretum. Um, there are plenty of arboreta around to, to go to. I mean, from Coventry, um, I think there's one in Staffordshire, and the, obviously the, the biggest one, the National Arboretum at Western Bird, is very well known, although it'd be horribly busy. And, and speaking of which, I was one at this weekend. I was at the Winkworth Arboretum, which is a National Trust property in Surrey. And they're still operating a booking system there. Um, so even though it's outdoors, they, they had X number of slots per half an hour, whatever it was. So I booked for the afternoon and I got there and it was rammed. It was very, very busy. I mean, it's also the final weekend of half term, which probably explains it too, but that was very, very busy. And one thing this um, this autumn, which um, even as we walked in, the, the lady at the gate said, you won't see much colour because autumn's running late this year. And um, so at least Pat's got plenty of time to um, to, to get his, his or her act together and get out there. Right. But I'll, I'll read them. Certainly there are lots of them around. Just Google it. Um, I mean, uh, Wingworth I mentioned, Western but I mentioned, Batsford is very well known in Gloucestershire. Um, I went to one in Yorkshire, which is uh, Thorpe Perro. Um, but if you like, you know, colourful trees, I mean, you know, I know some landscape photographers do consider Arboretum a bit like um, oh, this Disneyland for trees, I suppose. <laughs> so it's not particularly <laughs> a, a flattering uh, representation of them. But I quite like red leaves and everything else. And I, you know, I, I like to get the macro lens out, get the tripod out and arrange uh, leaves on the ground for pretty compositions. I, I, I like those uh, those locations. What about you, Kingsley? Where would you uh, suggest Pat go? Well, me and Will had a lovely day out at Western Burt Arboretum one year. Um, and that was, I, I was, I was a little bit, I was worried about that, not because Will was trying, um, <laughs> because we had a very nice time, but it was more to do with the fact that you couldn't get in like until 
nine o'clock or something and i was thinking like oh like is this going to be a bit a bit noddy you know uh, are, are we not going to get the light we want but actually we kind of got there and it was like it was a bit misty the sun was still pretty low and obviously because you're in tree cover like the, the height of the sun isn't really as important as it is if you're out in the middle of nowhere with kind of with with, with no cover um so you, you know you get a bit more of that kind of broken pattern and the backlighting and stuff but like I, yeah i mean i, I would definitely recommend our Ar- Ar- arboretums if, if that's the sort of thing that you want i, I know what will saying about like does it feel like because you are going to managed woodland and somehow that doesn't quite feel like the the true landscape but you know i mean you can still you, you get some beautiful images i mean if if people want to research it then going to the kind of the, the usual websites the forestry commission the woodland trust places like that you you can you can look at the forests that are near you because they all have these really good search engines now as well for stuff like that and then you know a little bit of extra research in terms of finding out kind of what trees are in those locations will help obviously you know you're not going to be wanting to go to a pine forest necessarily um because it's going to look pretty much the same as it does any other time of the year uh it's pretty green yeah which is pretty green um but like if you're looking for places with like beaches and maples and rowans and ash trees and things like that then that's sort of where you're going to get color in terms of like going places that away from home i think i think it's great to get out and make the effort and go and have like days in the forest and stuff and pack accordingly but you can also keep a watch on places near where you are because you might discover that actually like a little bit of color turns a scene that maybe wasn't particularly interesting into something that is quite nice you know depends how you frame it i guess you maybe look for look at different focal lengths which might kind of isolate the trees against like i I like framing you know nice old buildings between trees and stuff like that and almost using them as 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 kind of as as borders or edging i'm not wanting to sound paranoid (laughs) in any way shape or form however already on this podcast it has come to light that you and will are in a whatsapp group talking about new cameras <laughs> and you and will have gone away to western Bert together and i've not been involved in either of those groups or you know is it is it i mean is it time for me to is it time for me to leave you two to it here? We'll, plan, we'll plan a goal we'll plan a golfing weekend at some point. <laughs> wonderful i'm in <laughs> good okay well that's uh hopefully that helps pat head to your arboretum Arboreta, that's um that's a plural of arboretum, isn't it? Um head to your arboreta or your Forestry Commission, National Trust, Woodland Trust, that type of place should be able to uh, get some good images. Talking of trees, as we're inevitably going to be related to autumn, Graham Sandalwood has been in touch and he said so that's quite apt, Graham Sandalwood, that's quite apt, isn't it? Um what are the team's favorite lenses for shooting in woodland? And what other accessories are useful at this time of the year? Kingsley, back to you on this. 300 mil? <laughs> well, actually, <laughs> uh, actually, yes. I do like a 300 mil in the woods. Um, that surprises me. Yeah. Um, I think that, I, I probably said before, I, I have a thing like about woodland. I think, I think genuinely think the longer sort of standard focal lengths and a bit longer can be very good in woodland because woodlands are quite chaotic and there's a lot of clutter and there's light coming from different places. And a lens that lets you be a little bit more selective can be quite good. I mean, that's not to say that you can't go and get a great picture with a 14 mil uh, if you get the framing right, but it does mean that your composition needs to be a little bit um, more uh, exacting, I would probably say, because, you know, like I say, there, there is sort of so much going on in woods, you know, from the sort of the clutter on the on the floor to the, to the colours of the leaves that are going to be above you. And mm-hmm. also, obviously, the wider you shoot, the greater your field of view, and therefore you you, you can get sort of bits of sky kind of creeping in that maybe you're a bit overexposed um so yeah like i i can't if i'm wandering around woodland i'll quite often i'll quite often take a 70 to 200 actually and maybe like a 50 mil sort of fast lens as well because the other thing you can do with those lenses is, is obviously sort of isolate the like a subject like a like a like a particular trunk or something you know if you mm-hmm. find it, it it's sort of in a clearing um or something like that and something else that i've often um enjoyed doing in woodland <laughs> <laughs> is um is actually kind of using a bit of um trying to use a bit of foreground leaf action um and getting that defocused in front of the in front of the scene so you sort of top a scene with a bit of a bit of blurry leaf um and if there's something i mean you know you can cheat a bit like i'm i'm not averse to grabbing some leaves off the ground and kind of like 
you know, dangling them near the front of the lens just to give it a bit of because it, it gives it a bit of depth um, that way. It, it feels like you're sort of looking through something towards a scene, you know, rather than it being this kind of this, I don't know, sort of single plane. So the, the wide angle lens, I mean, there are there are applications for it. Right. I mean, the, the thing is, is sort of um, one of the one of the shots that seems to work quite nicely in woodlands that's wide angle is where you look straight up. Now it's not necessarily autumn specific, mm-hmm. is it? And, you know, but that sort of, that view, if you look overhead and see whether or not you've got lots of sort of little branches and fingers of trees that are kind of coming together and that, that can work really effectively on a wide angle, can it not? You're right about the wide angle. I mean, one use for the wide angle I like, especially if you get when the focus is close, is if you get a um, appropriate bit of fungi in the foreground, and you can put that into the context of the woods. I mean, obviously, this assumes that, you know, a place which isn't too busy and there's all these people walking around in your in your background. But if you get fungi, you, you see a nice, for instance, one of these red and white little toadstools in a fly agaric, and you focus in close and you, you've got the camera virtually always on the ground. You can get these lovely pictures where the fungi is kind of the main subject and you've got a bit of a wide angle view, you've got the, the environment lending to the picture. But to answer to Graham's question, though, in terms of lens, cho- lens choice, I'll go for the 100 mil, 105 macro lens, depending on what, what camera system you use. Because, I mean, just to use my example, being at Winkworth at the weekend, I walked around with 105 macro lens and virtually did a lot, all my shots on that. It did exactly what Kingsley said, which is pick out and isolate odd trees. But being macro, I could do stuff on the ground without having to change lens. Um, if it was misty, which it wasn't, it would have been... Um, an opportunity obviously to to use that uh, perspective you get when when it's misty um, and it's just traveling light as well i mean that's one thing i would like to like to do nowadays in terms of a favorite accessory roger i'd go for the tripod i mean i use a tripod a lot in the summer but in the autumn it's you know it's more or less essential i find so i mean to answer graham's question there yeah my favorite accessory landscape in the autumn is definitely definitely a good tripod that's uh, I mean, it, it, it's, and especially in woodland, because you because you've still got leaf uh, leaf cover, you've, you've also got dropping light levels. So you can't you can't hold handheld that easily in woodland unless you're kind of pushing your ISO. Um, in terms of accessories, I just thought actually a, a, quite a good accessory that people quite often don't use or they just leave in their camera bag is the is the sort of the humble lens hood. Um, and if you're in woodland, you've got quite a lot of stuff that could be falling on you, whether it's water droplets or leaves or whatever. And it can be kind of quite a good little kind of protective thing. So it's not doing its normal job of cutting out kind of stray light, but actually it can be sort of just shielding the front element against drops coming off, you know, uh, leaves and things above. And Kingsley, the, you talking about drops brings me to another favourite accessory as my, of mine. And I often have one in the in the boot of this time of year, and that's one of those um, water atomizers, you know, that people use for for the house plants. Because if you go out in the autumn, it's often dew, but you know, typically you might get a real nice scene, and the you know a bit of glisten on the leaves would help that picture. If you've got your own water supply in the in the spray bottle, a zap of that, and as it drips down off the leaves, the nice close-ups with a light coming through the water droplet. Oh, awesome! Did you call it a water atomizer, Will? Well, I couldn't think of what else to call it. It's one of those things. It's a water sprayer, isn't it? A water it spray. It does atomise the water, though, doesn't it? So it's like a perfume bottle, but it's for water. Oh, I see. I know, I know, this, I know the spray drops are slightly bigger, but it's one of those spray bottles you buy from the garden centre. Right, OK. I wondered um, on earth what you were talking about when you said water atomizer. I thought it was like some sort of accessory I'd never heard of. And I, I think one thing, it, it doesn't really relate directly to um, Graham's question, but I suppose we... I. I think I've assumed a lot about what we've been talking about so far has been in really nice sunny weather and sort of, you know, the low sun and all this sort of stuff. And of course, that's excluding a whole load of potential in autumn because you have got things like mist, you know, and sort of early morning dew, as you say, and stuff like that. And I guess it's 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 not necessarily going out in bright, sunny conditions, although the light can be absolutely stupendous at this time of year. There is a lot of value in going out in misty conditions because you can do the things like you're talking about, Will, in terms of isolating leaves using a macro lens, or you can do more long telephoto stuff like like you, Kingsley. Agreed. And that 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 is the kind of like the 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 sort of the the real win in woodland is if you're if you get there and there's mist and you you're starting to get kind of sun rays cutting through. You know that's like that's the king shot, isn't it? It is. And everything I'd like to add in terms of weather conditions. I mean, some people are put off by by strong windy days 
and uh, actually they can work well for autumn you know if you have a, a longish shutter speed a nice bit of blur it can work quite well i mean obviously you have to be a little wary with the tripod and you may need to shelter the tripod with your body to stop any vibrations but windy days can be really fun you get some interesting pictures as well so whatever the weather go out with your camera is the uh, is the is the watch word here okay let's let's do another question which comes from p greggs on email don't know i don't know who p is male or female again um but he or she says what exposure tips do you recommend for landscapes outside of the usual stuff like shooting at small apertures kingsley what do you reckon so i mean presumably we're talking about you know functionality on cameras that you can use to help with your uh, with your exposure other than the usual stuff like small apertures i'm i'm going to jump straight in and talk about um like i wouldn't necessarily assume to use i, I know it's the given i know it's like the, the first thing that people tend to learn about landscapes is that you set f16 and you know front to back sharpness and stuff like that but you know just 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 as a side point you should try and mix it up uh, you know in in well and again particularly in woodland like where, where you you know if, if you're shooting wide open you're you're going to you're going to kind of simplify a scene probably a bit more um but like in terms of other stuff like i guess actually may, maybe it links in with this too because i i would quite often try and shoot a landscape where i think the lens is at its sharpest and that might be kind of f8 f11 f14 something like that because you know it's the very smaller apertures you can get like a little bit of softness creeping in through diffraction um and what comes in there is is focus stacking obviously people think of focus stacking as well they don't always think of focus stacking as something to do with macro photography but it's really useful for landscapes because if, if you can shoot you know three exposures you're going to get that kind of real front to back sharpness because what you know even if you're shooting f16 if you're focusing kind of 40 centimeters from the front of the lens what you're going to find is that your background your distant mountain or whatever is going to be a little bit soft and you have to um, accommodate that by kind of switching your focus point and kind of shooting a separate exposure and then and then blending them sort of later in photoshop okay anything to you anything else from from, from you will in terms of um bits to use on the camera so i mean i think you've talked about before about using things like um you know a delay on your on the shutter release so self timer that type of thing yeah uh, yeah i would roger um, but in terms of um p greg's question in terms of exposure tip i mean one thing i i like to do obviously depending on lighting conditions is the bracket exposures because if you are shooting under cover and uh, you know you've got the deep shadows of the the woodland floor <clears throat> and if the sun happens to be shining as well then you've got the you've got really strong highlights too if there's not too much movement and of course that is an issue i mentioned window a couple of minutes ago but if there's all movement bracketing's out but if if the landscape's quite still it's worth bracketing your exposures and i might do um a five stop bracket you know five shot bracket one plus or minus one one f stop um, and then merge them. I might not merge all five. I might merge only three of them. But if I've, if I've got a contrast scene, that's something I'd recommend. And it's also because I like shooting against the light. I mean, in terms of exposure tip, you know, I, I know a lot of photographers like, I mean, my partner Annie's a good example. You know, we saw a subject uh, recently and she went to one side of the scene where she was shooting with the light on it. And I went to the other side of the same scene and I was shooting against the light. Right. So, you know, it, 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 there's obviously a case for, for both, but I tend to like shooting against the light. And that, again, is a, a technique where bracketing can be really, really, very useful, certainly to, uh, to get detail in both the highlights and the shadows. So focus stacking, a bit of bracketing. Anything else, Kingsley? Like I, I, I would definitely pitch in for exposure delay or self-timer because, you know, if, if, it is, if it is sort of the ultimate sharpness you're kind of going for, you know, it, it can really, really, really help um something else i also noticed recently more of having kind of moved to mirrorless is is the usefulness of the evf when it's set to display i can't remember what the actual mode is called basically when it when it displays exactly what you're getting so it displays the mm. depth of field and the actual lightness of the exposure rather than a sort of a like a general brightness which you sometimes mm. um and what that makes it really easy to do is position um grad filters more easily so like on a dslr you would have to use your or certainly i would end up using my depth of field preview to kind of right. stop down because what, what happens is that lenses are always 
composing at their widest aperture sort of because of the demands of af i guess um because they need the most light for that but that that what that does is it blurs out massively the the grad that you put so you can't really see where it is but if you if you're shooting at like f16 and you hit your uh depth of field preview button on a dslr or you use this mode on mirrorless which shows you exactly what you're getting then you can see it a lot easier and you can place it a lot easier. So, you know, you, you, it means that if you're shooting like 20 second exposure landscapes and you look at it and you're like, oh, oh, the, the grad was not angled correctly or it's too high or it's too low. It means you don't kind of waste those exposures. I think different manufacturers will give them n- different names, won't they? But it's effectively mm. like a sort of an exposure preview, isn't it? Manual exposure yeah. preview type function. Yeah. OK, great. Well, that's re- that's really good. And let's do let's do one more question. And this one comes from Tom Rogers, who's in Bristol. And he says uh, this is slightly different um, uh, on the autumn theme. When I'm uh, shooting around the golden hour, he says, I've been trying to compose with the low sun in the frame. So I get sun stars but mine have failed to impress me. I know I need to use a small aperture, but do the team have any other suggestions? Now, I suppose the first thing to say is you need to be super careful when you're photographing into the sun, um, especially if you're using a longer lens. So you, you definitely shouldn't be looking directly um, through, the, through the lens at, the, um, at a sun star. But Kingsley, have you got anything else to add? I mean, presumably Tom is working at an aperture of f16, F22, something like that. But what what else can he do to try and get better sun stars? Yeah, the, so the sun stars being the kind of the distinctive pointy shape that you get from any light source at, at usually at smaller apertures. I mean, I, I don't think it fully follows that you can only get them at the very smallest of apertures, but I think they become more distinctive um, sort of as as you do stop down. So like, there, I, well, one thing that that is a, is a sort of a known quantity is that different lenses produce different qualities of sun star. So depending on the number of aperture blades the lens has and its and its design. So say say you've got two 14 mil lenses from different manufacturers, they will produce different sun stars. So what people who are really into sun stars do is they is they look for these lenses that do really good to, to create really nice shapes, the most kind of pleasing shapes. Obviously pleasing is is kind of subjective um but you know you can go online and look for like lists of the best lenses that, that to, to produce sun stars and quite often they are you know without being in, in the slightest bit disparaging they're quite often they're they are the cheaper brands um with and, and with so what, what you get now is quite often you get lenses released and they say it's got like nine a nine bladed aperture and it's rounded and what that does is it it, it produces really smooth out of focus areas with sun stars everything sort of needs to be in focus mm. um so those things aren't particularly important and what they they don't give very good sun stars but if you've got like a like a seven bladed aperture and also that it's straight it will give you a harder sun star so get to the shops <laughs> get to the internet <laughs> does, the, does the number of apertures uh, sorry does the number of uh, blades in the diaphragm dictate the number of points on the star Yes, a spotter's badge for Rog. Thank uh, you. <laughs> so, so you can. So. <laughs> yeah, right, it's. Okay. Um, I think it's even. Jump in, Will. Help me, Will. Help me, Will. <laughs> what, in terms of numbers. Yeah, is it odd? Is it odd ones? Odd ones double the number, and even ones are the same number. So if you've got like a five, you get ten points, and if you've got like a an eight bladed aperture Gosh. you get eight is that right well, fair kingsley i've never heard that t- particular yeah, i was gonna say why on earth would that be the case is, well well because of the mysteries of light Raj. <laughs> <laughs> light or life <laughs> well i guess i guess both I th- i'm pretty sure that's true i mean you know i'm, I'm happy to be like shot down like a, an invading fighter plane um <laughs> if if that's not the case but i'm pretty sure that the the odd number odd odd numbered aperture blades give you double and and even numbered aperture blades give you give you that number of sun star of points on a sun right. star. Well, well, Kingsley, whether that's right or wrong, you're certainly <laughs> right. I think about the the lenses comment you made about the cheaper lenses being more um, susceptible to, to this, if you like, optical flaw which we're using here, um, and which what Tom's after. And the other thing to consider is the size of the sun, that because a light source is a big issue here. And if you've got a sun which is diffused in any way by cloud. Hmm. It becomes a bigger light source and therefore becomes less liable to give you these pointy stars. I mean, that's why I think when you, for instance, if you're out photographing at night and you've got street lamps in a shot, often you get real good 
sun stars, if you want to call them sun stars, from a, from a light source, because they're much, it's a smaller light source, I think. Um, so it's more difficult with the sun. And I mean, the challenge with the sun, of course, is just this huge contrast range you've got to work with. So, so I think Tom's being uh, very ambitious to try and get <laughs> sun stars of a bright naked sun, you know, let alone the, the safety aspects you mentioned, Roger, and quite rightly so. But um, I suppose the other thing maybe Tom should consider, and going back to the 80s and 90s when such filters were popular, what about buying a starburst filter? <gasps> I was about to say that, Will, so I'm glad Hang you on, I'm leaving. Come <laughs> <laughs> on, the starburst do, filter. You make your own by using um, a, you know, a UV filter and getting some petroleum jelly and smearing it on the, <laughs> and ruining your filter, of course. But you maybe there's an element of DIY um, to be had here, maybe. I think that um, that that concept of a I think I mean, you, you will if you've got a sun that's in the sky, you know, sort of unobscured, it will still give you a sun star. But they, they become more pronounced if they're next to something or or the light is coming through something. So like if you so I guess with leaves, if you're in woodland and the sun is, po mm -hmm. is poking through, you know, fine leaf cover, then right. again, it, it will produce a larger star. I was just wondering what you meant when you said this, uh, when you've got a sun that's in the sky. Yeah, as opposed well, it to sounds a like a, <laughs> it's, a, it's a song that I'm writing. That's just some lyrics. <laughs> Good stuff. Well, there we go, Tom. I think uh, maybe so there's some if you want to go out and buy yourself a, a cheap lens with with uh, what was it? Five aperture blades, then you're laughing. Otherwise, it's a starburst filter, I think. So we do have one further question. But because this is uh, this particular episode is sponsored by the the lovely people at MPB. We've passed this question over to them, and that's it's a relatively short, short one. It comes from Jane Grayson in Winchester, and she asked, uh, I'm relatively new to photography and really enjoy taking landscapes. I'd like to get a wide angle zoom for my Sony A6300. What would the guys at MPB recommend? It doesn't have to be an own brand lens. So we passed this question on to Ian at MPB, and this is the answer he came up with. Um, well, thank you very much, uh, Jane, for your question. And yes, we can absolutely recommend uh, a wide angle zoom for your, for your camera. Um, for me personally, um, I think this is quite, a, quite an easy option, I would say. Um, from personal experience, uh, it's a lens that I've used many times and I've always been incredibly impressed with the results in relation to the, to the cost of the lens. So I would say that's the, the Sony Carl Zeiss Vario Tessar. 16 to 70 f4 za uh, za uh, oss um it truly is a fantastic lens i'm not entirely sure how uh, how sony have managed to keep the price point uh, so low on this lens considering how good it is i imagine it's likely because of its relatively um small f4 maximum aperture but one of the good things about that is is that being a crop sensor lens um, it means that it's incredibly light and it actually it's actually really well mated to the, uh, to the A6300's uh, form factor. So you won't ever feel like it's too heavy um, for the camera. Um, but it has an incredible um, range, I would say. So 16 to 70 is probably equivalent on a crop sensor um, to about a 24 to uh, 100. Um, so you have quite a range there to actually capture landscapes. Um, and obviously, because you're doing landscapes as well, it means that you might not necessarily be making a lot of use of a much faster aperture like f2.8 or f2, for example. Uh, this lens also has um, uh, optical uh, stabilization, which will work beautifully with, with the body as well. And this being obviously a collaboration between Sony and Carl Zeiss, it means that for a relatively small amount of money, you get to have a Carl Zeiss um, glass um, on your zoom lens. So in terms of pricing, um, we can actually do a excellent condition at 16 to 70 uh, for 314 pounds, um, or you can get it in good condition, which um, it might have a couple of more scuffs, for example, here and there uh, for 274 pounds. So I think that's enough questions answered. Well, I hope it's enough questions answered. We've rattled through some there. Um, do let us know if you've liked us doing this question and answer format, and we will consider doing it in the future, uh, for obviously for some other subject, uh, perhaps, perhaps portraits or lighting or whatever, whatever you'd like. So let us know. Um, so I think that just leaves us to wrap up this podcast in the same way as we would do any other podcast. 
which was we would go to Will and ask for one of his infamous or famous words of wisdom. So, Will, starburst filter aside, <laughs> what is your word of wisdom about? I think star? infamous is definitely right. My suggestion for listeners this week is, is a simple one. I mean, basically, we'd be talking about autumn or pod. And one thing I will do this time of year is go through my, the contents of my car and my camera bag and make sure I'm auto, ready for autumn, basically. And when, when I say that, I mean, it's because my, my car boot is full of stuff I have for photography. I have spare filters in there, bits for tripods and et cetera, et cetera. And I do have different requirements in the, in the summer compared with the, the autumn and winter. So it might be simple things like, you know, this time of year, I would expect to get rained on and get horribly wet. So I've got spare micro towel, microfiber towels in the car, which I know sounds a bit desperately sad, but they're really quite useful. I've got soaked. I remember one time I got soaked in, the, in uh, Dartmoor, um, really, really soaking wet. And I wanted to get back to the hotel and have my waterproof. So I'm like, rather than take them off, I just laid a towel on my car seat and sat on my uh, towel until I got to the hotel and changed there. So it's just making sure I'm geared up both photographically and non-photographically for the autumn. So like I said, it might be clothing, it might be towels, it might be wellies, it might be bags to put wet stuff in, it might be torches and, and head torches, all that sort of thing. So, I mean, just think about some of the answers we've given some of the questions here in this pod and, and just gear up accordingly. So when you do face great light, great location, you can make the most of the opportunity. So your car boot is being emptied of palm tree shirts and Bermuda <laughs> shorts. Yes, <laughs> it's being replaced. With hand water. warmers, lots of hand warmers, ponchos. <laughs> I like the idea, Will, of you setting up some kind of emergency service for photographers. You know, like you're the sort of AA equivalent where somebody can phone phone you up and just say, I've got I've got drenched in a downpour. Can you help me? I'm on the B5313 near wherever. And you and you say, Yeah, I'll be there in a couple of hours, and you come with warm towels and hand warmers. I think that'd be quite nice. Well, maybe we should set up um, our equivalent of international rescue. Well, indeed. Well, indeed. You know, but no, who's, no who's doubt. Gonna put in the, who are going to put in our space then? <laughs> yeah. Well, no doubt you and Kingsley will have had a chat in a WhatsApp group about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I'll, I'll wait for that to happen. Right. Well, there we go. Um, that's another episode, 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 episode of the Photography News Podcast done and dusted, which just leaves me then to say thank you to editor of Photography News, Mr. Will Chung. Thanks, Will. You're welcome, guys. Take care. Nice to see you both. And to you too. And thank you also to orange gilet wearing <laughs> and soon to be Z9 owning <laughs> contributing editor, Mr. Kingsley Singleton. Thanks, Kingsley. Thanks. It was uh, lots of fun. Yes. The phrase should be what I've, what I've taken from Will's word of wisdom there is that the sombrero is no friend of autumn. <laughs> The sombrero is definitely no friend of autumn indeed. Well, and on that hat related note, we will leave you and we'll be back in a couple of weeks. We'll speak to you then. Cheers now. Bye. This photography news podcast is sponsored by MPB. Enjoy contact-free doorstep pickups which are safe, convenient, fully insured and completely free of charge. Plus, with a quarter of a million customers and five stars on Trustpilot, you can trust them and sleep easy.